Galileo Galilei is widely considered to be the father of modern science and one of the greatest philosophers to have lived. Galileo played a pivotal role in the developments of the scientific revolution, overturning key tenets of Aristotelian physics and most significantly advocating mathematics as the language of science. For Galileo, the physics of the past was plagued with unhelpful sensory qualities like colours, tastes, smells and sounds. For science to make progress, he thought, the book of the universe must be written in a purely quantitative language. For Durham University's Philip Goff, this was Galileo's error. The hard problem of consciousness was born when Galileo stripped consciousness away from the scientific picture. Somehow, we must find a way back. We must lay the foundations for a new science, a new science of consciousness. As always, thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and the West Hill Endowment, as well as all of our loyal patrons for supporting the show. In particular, thank you to the six individuals re-enchanting the universe and imbuing it once again with meaning. Dylan Kirby, Lily Hooper, David Legeness, Mr. T, Jim Clare, and our newest patron, Jimmy Casperson. You're all phenomenal, just like everything else. If you're as committed to revolutionising the Pansycast as Dylan, David, Lily, Mr. T, Jimmy and Jim, then don't make an error. Head over to the Patreon page forward slash the Pansycast to show your support. A link is also available in the iTunes description. In part one, we're going to be looking at the foundations for a new science of consciousness. And in part two, we'll be engaging in some further analysis and discussion. Hello and welcome to episode 69 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the man with a sturdy frame and lengthy beard striking fear into the hearts of duelists everywhere, Mr. Jack Symes. I'm joined once again by the man keeping his Pan Psychist views secret in case they reduce his chances of employment, Dr. Gregory Miller. Hello. And returning guest, the man pushing his way out of the bar to stand in the cold rain, philosopher and consciousness researcher at Durham University, Philip Goff. Hello, thanks for having me. Good to be back. Episode 25 was the when you were last with us. It was. Your interview with, uh, with David Papineau. It's great to have you back on and to put you through some of our, like we have some introductory questions we ask all of our guests now, which you mm. managed to avoid last time. Uh, the first of which is probably the easiest one of the lot. Uh, what is philosophy? The easiest, that's the easiest question. Um, I think the aim of philosophy is to construct a systematic worldview that is able to accommodate everything we know to be real. Mm. If you think that the only things that we know to be real are known on the basis of observation and experiment, then I think your philosophy will more or less collapse into science. You know, maybe there's a room for conceptual clarification or but more or less uh, but if you think there are things we know to be real independently of observation and experiment, then that gives us an autonomous or semi-autonomous role for philosophy in bringing together the things we know from observation and experiment and the things we know in other ways into a single unified worldview. Right. So when we're doing philosophy, we're pulling everything together to see how it all hangs together in the broadest possible sense. Yeah. How then does, is that how philosophy makes progress then by pulling things together and saying, look, this is how it fits into the picture or does it make progress in other ways? Yeah, I guess I'm somewhat inclined to think proper metaphysics hasn't really begun yet. (laughs) You know, never in history, I think, have we had three things, mature natural science, a general consensus that systematic metaphysics needs to be taken seriously Mm -hmm. and a general consensus that consciousness needs to be taken seriously in the sense that, you know, the need to account for consciousness is is a constraint on metaphysical inquiry. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I think we're kind of getting there. I'm hopeful that uh, we will get these three things in place at some point and we can start doing proper metaphysics and, and hopefully we'll make some progress then. So that would ideally be the kind of, you know, culmination of well, the, the end point of this progress, right? When all these three things to come together. But to go back to the start, of all of this, how is it that you first got into the subject that is philosophy? I guess I've just always been obsessed by, I guess, the things that don't seem to fit into our standard scientific picture of things. You know, there are a number of these phenomena um, that trouble philosophers 
consciousness being an obvious one, free will, mm. facts about value, abstract objects, all of these things. It's hard to see how they, they fit in with our you know, standard scientific view of things. I, but I guess I think consciousness is, is the kind of most captivating because it, with all the others, it's at least an option to deny the, the, the existence of the phenomenon. You know, maybe, maybe there aren't really facts about value. Mm. Maybe we're not really free in the way we think we are. Mm -hmm. uh, may, maybe talk of abstract objects is just a sort of useful fiction. But with consciousness, it seems to be the thing that, you know, it's just so hard to deny the reality of but it's also so hard to fit in. So I guess, yeah, I've just always been driven to, to uh, you know, how does, how does this all fit together? It's annoying. It stops you sleeping when you can't fit it all together. Well, uh, as listeners will know, in the near future, we're interviewing um, uh, Stephen Mumford, and he told us uh, yesterday when we did actually interview him in real life that when he was nine years old, right, he was struck by the thought in bed at night mm -hmm. that I have thoughts that no one else can know about there is this special thing that happens here no one knows what mm -hmm. i'm thinking and then he said the thing next thing that immediately struck him was and i can't know what anyone else is thinking mm -hmm. is this were you at a young age then when you kind of thought oh wow, wow there is this problem it's consciousness or there is this problem it's value or was it kind of through going to school and university that you got into philosophy yeah i think like like many people i had these familiar cartesian intuitions and cartesian in a very broad sense that you know Maybe what I see as red isn't the same as what you see as red. You know, is, is what you see as green. And we would never tell. I remember talking to my my big cousin about this, actually, you know, and I felt very uh, grown up talk, having a deep discussion with my cousin who was sort of six years older than me and, um, uh, you know, about this kind of thing. And I mean, I really trust those intuitions. I think there's a move in the 20th century to think, oh, that's sort of childish. You go, You go through this phase of these Cartesian intuitions and then you... You know, you grow up and read some Wittgenstein and you grow out of it. But, you know, I think those, those are almost universal, those intuitions. You know, we might be in the matrix. The, uh, and I think they are, you know, solid gold to me. Um, yeah, I remember that. I just remember actually that discussion with my cousin. I think I then said, you know, what's square to you might be what's triangular to me. And he said, no, that doesn't make sense. And that was, that was <laughs> at the end of the discussion. But yeah. Like John Locke. I think he was probably just irritated by this little cousin annoying him. But if, if you didn't go have this kind of let's call it philosophical influence from your cousin or just these debates and things, um, if you weren't a philosopher, what do you think you would be doing for a living? Oh uh, well, I I I didn't, I didn't want to be a philosopher. I always wanted to be a rock star, and uh, you know it's a miracle I went to university. I just wanted to drop out of school and become a rock star with my amazing band. But um, what was the the band called? number and number <laughs> and uh yeah we were incredible but the the world didn't appreciate us so yeah it was not to be uh sadly but um yeah uh i think yeah actually i mean i struggled for about a, a year to get an academic job and i was thinking oh what else do i want to do and i think i would have liked to maybe work for a charity i mean that sounds very like i'm trying <laughs> very noble or something but i don't know just to feel like um you're doing something useful, mm. you're doing something that I think that can be enjoyable to feel like you're doing something. Any particular causes that you'd, you'd, you'd join in to, to support? Well, I'm also, I'm also kind of very passionate about politics as well. So maybe something uh, community organizing or uh, environmental charity or tax justice, into tax justice these kind of things well links nicely with our, our next question um rutger bregman who you might, might be aware of the the dutch yeah historian, we had him on the show earlier this year and he said when he was a, a student i think he was a first year student at the time about 19 yeah. years old and his his professors told him that everyone should have a philosophical hero and so he got home and he started googling for great 20th century minds and came across bertrand russell who converted him from uh, theism to atheism and stands now as you know, someone who still writes about him. Is it Russell's essay about idleness, the importance of idleness or something like this? So and it's why I'm not a Christian. Oh, he's got another one on like, uh, so motivating Bregman's thought that it's okay to have like a three day work week. Uh -huh. um, it's a good thing to be idle and, mm -hmm. and do things that are intrinsically worthwhile. But is there someone like that you had when you were a, uh, perhaps an undergraduate or even before, like a significant intellectual figure, which has had, uh, has had deep influence on you? Philosophically. Um, well, I suppose the obvious thing is 
Descartes, I mean, I think the first two meditations are basically completely right. <laughs> and um, uh, it goes a bit sketchy after that and when he tries to prove the existence of God in pretty implausible line of reasoning. But, um, you know, I, th I, th I think that it, that it basically got the epistemological situation right mm. that one's own mind, one's own conscious mind is known with much greater level of certainty mm -hmm. than the external world and facts about the external world. I mean, I think that really does capture our epistemological situation. Again, there's a move in the 20th century to think, oh, that's what you think when you're a kid and then you, you it's all confusion you. But, um, I, you know, I sort of think that move was a sort of inverted snobbery to these kind of very clear and obvious philosophical intuitions that I, that I think are uh, ultimately correct. When we spoke to uh, Daniel Dennett, we gave him essentially uh, one of uh, Galen Strawson, who, who was your PhD supervisor mm -hmm. at one stage, yeah. wasn't he? Who I think he criticizes Daniel Dennett and saying something like, it's very often that supervisors or teachers um, print on their students lasting philosophical views, and Dennett's mm. a case of that. How influential do you think Strawson was on on the development of your philosophical views? I think he, I think I sort of had the views already, but he was very, very important in giving me confidence to have, because when I, I was undergraduate at Leeds and nobody had, you know, I didn't know about panpsychism. I didn't, you know, everyone was sort of just materialism is obviously true. Mm. Uh, and I sort of guess I kind of lost confidence to think, you know, that no one thinks these things. And then I came to Reading and then, you know, the new professor, um, I mean, that, that was the attraction to Reading, really, the um, presence of Galen there, but the, the new professor had, you know, all these views I had about, not just about consciousness, but also about um, the thought is grounded in consciousness and a sort of anti-Humean view of causation, finding that the, the pure Humean regularity, he doesn't like calling it Humean, he'll get annoyed if he hears that, but uh, the, the sort of, it's all just regularities view is, is really implausible. So that was just, in the first week just gave me so much confidence mm. to think, oh my God, actually these views can be taken seriously and um also a big influence on me was david papano actually who had completely the opposite views but um i had some supervisions with uh during my phd and you know he very kindly helped me argue against him and uh, it was really wonderful you know I, I, lo I love engaging with people i disagree with actually and, you know really getting inside the head and trying to work out how they're seeing things, why they're thinking these things that seem so obviously wrong to me. And so that was a real influential thing, getting inside David Papineau's head, so to speak, <laughs> understanding his madness. So there's another question we ask all our guests is, um, throughout their kind of philosophical career, have they had any kind of, you know, shifts in their thinking? Um, so we had Eugene Negasauer on, and he said, you know, when he started his PhD, he was he was um, a theist materialist, and by the end, he was a committed a. I mean, or atheist materialist. Yeah. Athe atheist materialist. Sorry, and by the end, he's a committed uh, anti-materialist theist. Um, and we have other such examples as this. But in the book, you give us the example of, you know, during your undergraduate studies or graduate studies, you were a committed physicalist, right? You, were, I think you said, here's a quote from you. It says, it all came to me ahead one evening as I sat in a noisy, crowded bar, feeling the banging beat of the music in my chest as I enjoyed the taste of lager and the rush of nicotine from my first cigarette of the evening. Brackets, smoking in bars was legal in those days. <laughs> And I was suddenly overcome with a vivid sense of how real these conscious experiences were and of their clash with my official worldview. I pushed my way out of the bar, stood in the cold rain with my eyes closed, and I couldn't deny it anymore. I'd already accepted that if materialism true, then I was a zombie. But I knew I wasn't a zombie. I was a thinking, feeling human being. I could no longer live in denial of my own consciousness. Now, that's a, quite a seismic shift, right? Um, but are there any other seismic shifts in your thinking? Are oh. there any other things you kind of thought P and now you think not P or anything like this? Oh, you picked the most cringy bit of the book. <laughs> my, my wife told me to take that bit out. She just, this is just really cringy standing in the rain. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, yeah, so I went through the full gamut on consciousness stuff, I think, you, you know, partly because, you know, not having maybe intellectual figures that, in, you know, in my when I was an undergraduate who had the views I sort of initially sympathized with. Yeah, and another thing actually was shortly after that, uh, when I started graduate study at Reading, I was inclined to error theory about morality. So the view that 
uh, all moral sentences are false, and that's because there aren't really facts about good and bad and right and wrong. I think I was I talked a lot to there's a lot of ethics going on at Reading, and I talked a lot to Jonathan Dancy and Philip Stratton Lake, and they persuaded me that if you're going to be an error theorist about morality, hmm. you really need to extend that to all kinds of value, including, for example, uh, value claims involved in evidence, you know, that, you know, you ought to believe the evidence or, you know, so if, mm. if someone thinks that climate change is caused by the moon because they just read it in the tea leaves or something, you think you shouldn't believe that. That's, you can criticize someone. Mm. Uh, and so in a way, you can't take yourself to have a reason to believe the error theory because if you say, I have a reason to believe the error theory, that's, that's in itself a claim about value. And so that really converted me to completely the opposite view that I really got quite strong moral objectivist, which I am to this day. And that was, that was like also quite a big human level change. I could go out and do something, I don't know, some small good thing and think that was really good. I mean, that was, you know, objectively a good thing to do. And and, um, you know, that was, I vividly remember that. So, yeah, I think I always I relate. I don't think of these things as sort of abstract discussions. I think it's, you know, part of how you see the world and um, what you take reality to be like. And so, yeah, that was another big change. We're going to be discussing your book, Galileo's Error, today. As of 10 days ago, it was released and links in the iTunes description. That's what we're going to be looking at across these two parts. I imagine it takes a great deal of energy and um and work and revision to to write a book of this depth and quality have you been able to work on anything else at the same time or is there anything you're looking forward to working on now that the book's been finished and on the shelves um i i guess well it was i suppose it was quite a while ago i wrote in now um I, I found it much easier to write than my academic book actually i mean i had a horrific summer finishing my academic book consciousness and fundamental reality uh working just till very late at night when my wife was heavily pregnant and I could it was just I got to focus everything on this book whereas it was so much in more enjoyable in contrast actually to um to write a book aimed at a general audience where you can just sort of try and explore ideas and present them in a in an in an engaging mm -hmm. way rather than you know cover all objections and reference all you know everything you're talking about and so, but um, did you yeah. worry that the the rigor would be lost because going for writing your first pop philosophy book with what, were you worried that you wouldn't mm. do justice to the ideas by by making it accessible to the public? Well, I think you have to, in a certain sense, drop rigor. But I think I think that's why philosophers don't reach out more because we get trained to have an utterly watertight ar argument and cover all objections. And if you do that, it just gets incredibly inaccessible. Mm. So, to some extent, you have to give the argument more in broad brushstrokes. I suppose I felt like one, now I have the academic book with the fuller argument mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I could feel more comfortable about writing, you know, the, a, a more a looser version of the argument. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's still a pretty rigorous argument, I hope, but less covering all objections. I've, you know, I've got these two te short technical appendixes, appendices, I should say, um, covering some going a little bit more into technical stuff but i also have footnotes referring to the academic book so the reader who you know who wants to delve deeper into that can can, can follow that and also i'm mean, actually teaching using the book this term for the first time actually which is working really well to use galileo's error to introduce the students to each of the topics mm -hmm. and then use academic papers to to um you know delve into it a bit more deeply so what do you look at what uh, projects are on the horizon then? Um I've just finished a paper on for a volume that's coming out with Oxford University Press on quantum mechanics and consciousness. Mm. So I've been thinking about whether reflection on, you know, you know, so quantum mechanics is one of in terms of prediction is one of our most successful scientific theories, you know, all of our modern technology from smartphones to GPS is based on it. But the problem is no one knows what the hell it's telling us about reality. There's absolutely no consensus. Mm -hmm. So I'm exploring in this paper whether reflection on consciousness and the need to account for consciousness can help us make progress here. You know, I sort of think philosophers and scientists of the future will be 
flabbergasted that it won't be able to comprehend why philosophers in the 20th and early 21st century didn't make more of this reality of consciousness. You know, there's something we know with pretty much certainty to exist, and yet we take hardly any time to draw out the ontological implications of that phenomenon. Um, so, so specifically what I'm looking at is this view wave function monism, which is what many philosophers of physics take to be the most straightforward way of interpreting the ontology of quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And basically the rough idea is there's this very high dimensional kind of possibility space at the fundamental level. The number of dimensions, if you take the number of particles in the universe, mm -hmm. times it by three, then um, that's the number of dimensions. Right. It's really weird. Uh, and then the, the question is, I mean, a lot of people have discussed, can you get ordinary objects out of this? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if at the fundamental level you have particles, you can kind of make sense of them, you know, particles in three-dimensional space. You can kind of make sense of how they come together to make tables and chairs. But if you've got this wave function, this... Uh, field in incredibly high dimensional possibility space. How the hell do you get tables and chairs out of that? Mm. And um, I mean, one philosopher of physics, very good philosopher of physics, Alyssa Ney, she says in one paper, well, maybe us wave function monists don't need to believe in tables and chairs. Maybe the three dimensional world's just an illusion. So I talk, I think that's a bit of a problematic position. But what I ultimately say is, well, whether or not you have to account for three dimensional objects, you've got to account for consciousness. We know consciousness is real. And I think if you can't get three-dimensional objects, it's going to be hard to account for consciousness. And that's, you know, I don't assume any anti-materialist view or anything. I mean, even a materialist tends to account for consciousness in terms of brains. <laughs> and if you don't, if you can't have brains because you can't get any three-dimensional objects out of the wave function, then... So, so yeah, so, so it's, it's looking at whether this view, this interpretation of quantum mechanics mm -hmm. is compatible with the reality of consciousness. So yeah, that's what I've been, um, so that was a bit long winded, but uh, that's a paper I've just finished and kind of something a bit new. Part one, foundations for a new science of consciousness. So, Philip, this is the first question of part one. Mm -hmm. And usually when people kind of set up the problem of consciousness or these sorts of things, we all start like with Descartes and we go like, what is the hard problem of consciousness? Can maybe we've inherited from Descartes. But you, you, you've gone for a different approach in the book. You think, well, no, Descartes isn't where this problem came from. It's Galileo, right? Galileo has made this error. So maybe a good place to start would be with Galileo's error itself. What do you think, mm. what is it? that you claim this is. Yeah, so as you say, Galileo's known as the father of of modern science because it's Galileo who really shapes the philosophical foundations of the scientific revolution. So a key moment is Galileo's declaration that mathematics is to be the language of the new science. So the new science is to have a purely quantitative vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So this is much discussed moment, but what's less discussed is the philosophical work Galileo had to do to get to that position. And that's because before Galileo, following Aristotle, people thought that the physical world was filled with qualities. So there were colors on the surfaces of objects, smells floating through the air, tastes actually inside food. And the trouble is you, you, you can't capture these kind of qualities in a purely quantitative vocabulary like mathematics. You know, you can't capture in an equation the redness of, a, of, of red or the spiciness of paprika. So this is a challenge for Galileo's aspiration to exhaustively describe the physical world in mathematics. So what he did was propose a radically new philosophical theory of reality. You know, we, we think of him as a great scientist, which he was, but he was also a great philosopher. So he proposed this new theory according to which the qualities aren't really out there in the physical world, rather they're in the consciousness of the observer. So the the colors aren't really on... You know, so if you're looking at a tomato, mm. the redness 
isn't really out there on the surface of the tomato. Rather, it's in the consciousness of the person looking at the tomato. Or the you know the spiciness isn't really in the paprika. It's in the consciousness of the person eating it.、Um, or to take the age-old philosophical example, you know, for a tree's crashing down in a forest, the crashing sound isn't really in the forest. It's in the the consciousness of the person listening. So if there's no one there, no consciousness, no sound. So there you go. Question answered. So、uh, so Galileo, as it were, strips the physical world of its qualities. And after he's done that, all that remains are the purely quantitative features of matter: size, shape, location, motion, things that can be captured in mathematical geometry. So there's this. So in Galileo's worldview, there's this radical division between two domains: the the quantitative di- quantitative domain of science, the physical world with its、um, purely quantitative properties: size, shape, location, motion, and the Qualitative domain of consciousness, consciousness with its qualities of colors, sounds, tastes, and smells.、Um, so, 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 so this kicks off mathematical physics, which has gone incredibly well. But it's crucial to realize that this was that mathematical physics was only ever intended as a partial description of reality. Right, the whole project was premised、mm-hmm. on taking consciousness outside of the domain of science.、Mm-hmm. So that's the philosophical underpinnings of the scientific revolution. So why is this important for a science of consciousness? I think、um, you know it's th- there's broad agreement now that which there wasn't always、uh, that consciousness does pose a very serious, profound challenge、mm-hmm. to contemporary science. You know, despite great developments in our great progress in our understandings of the brain,、mm-hmm. we still don't have. Even the beginnings of of an explanation of how complex、um, electrochemical signaling is somehow able to give rise to an inner subjective world of colours and sounds and smells and tastes. So this is taken very seriously. But I think a lot of people think, okay, there's a problem here. But you know, we just need to keep doing us, you know, more neuroscience. Our standard ways of investigating the brain, and we'll eventually crack it. You, know, you get you get this in new scientists all the yeah, time. Yeah, but I mean, what if? So you mentioned this in the book, you right? You say, okay, so we have this, we have this problem. We've taken all this quantitative, we've we've made nature merely quantitative, quantitative. Sorry,、um, and now we need this new science of consciousness. And come on, we need to look to philosophers to help usher this in, right? To take consciousness seriously. But as you mentioned in the book, we have people like Stephen Hawking going, "Well, philosophy is dead," or Lawrence Krauss calling it a fairy tale and just say, "Get on with doing all this other stuff, right? There's no need for a new science of anything, or there's no need for philosophy to come in and help、yeah. here. We're doing it right in the first place." I mean, is there? What would you say to people who say, "Well, there is really no role for philosophy in this sort of thing, anyway"? Yeah, so I think we are currently going through a phase of history that people will look back on as a time when people were, you know, quite understandably so blown away by the success of physical science and the,、mm-hmm. you know, the incredible technology it's produced that they're inclined to think, "Oh, this is everything." This, you know, and that gives you a nice sense of certainty and security. We've got this thing that works, and you know, we know where to find the truth. But, and that's why people think, you know. Look at the great success of physical science. Of course, it's going to one day this crack the problem of consciousness. But I think this is all. This whole thing is rooted in a certain kind of misunderstanding of the history of science. Yes, physical science has been so successful, but it's been so successful precisely because it was designed to exclude consciousness.、Uh, you know, if Galileo were to time travel to the present day. And hear about this problem of explaining consciousness in terms of physical science. He'd say, "Of course you can't do that. I designed physical science to deal with the quantitative, not the qualitative." So physical science has been so successful because Galileo gave it a quite narrow, specific task. It's done very well at that. It's done very well with the quantitative. That doesn't give us any reason to think it's going to be very good at something. It was never designed for capturing the qualitative, subjective. Aspects of experience. Let us pause for a moment and hear a quick message from our sponsors, Gaston Luger. 
The Gaston Luger brand takes its inspiration from a French traveller who had customised his backpack to combine functionality with stylish exterior. I think it was Camus that once said, Life is absurd and we should be like Sisyphus smiling as we push the rock up and down the hill. But we all know, Sisyphus' smile would be much wider with a Gaston Luger backpack. Their new backpack and the latest accessory to my wardrobe is the Campy. The Campy combines form and function with a padded laptop compartment for your philosophical essays, a zipped front pocket inside to hide your copy of The Spoke Zarathustra, plus three quick access pockets on the outside for ethics, epistemology and metaphysics, so you never mix them up. The adjustable padded straps allow for a comfortable fit, essential in a state of nature, and its lightweight and water-resistant nylon material also make it durable enough to go literally anywhere with you. Or, if you can, the same place, Coinsburg, over and over again. To celebrate the festive season, Gaston's Black Friday offer gives you 25% off all of their backpacks. The offer starts on November 18th, 2019 and ends in early December. Again, that's 25% off and a free Arlick travel bag. If you're listening in the distant future, you can still get 15% off your backpack with the discount code PANSAI15. That's P-A-N-P-S-Y-1-5. All items are vegan, ethically transported, and Gaston Luger offer free returns on all of their products. Go to www.gastonluger.com and pick up one for yourself or a loved one today. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's head back over to the discussion. Galileo so is sparking the, the scientific uh, revolution and he's taking consciousness out of the picture um, so we can get on and do science. Hence all the great successes science made and hence why everyone's on the science train to science town thinking it's going to explain everything, including consciousness. Your point is it's not going to because the only reason this works or the great successes that came uh, from physics is being in the language of geometry and numbers and consciousness is not there. So you've taken out the thing you're trying to explain from the off. Probably the most common way of compensating for, like you, like you say, Galileo is only trying to give us a partial description of reality. For that other part of reality, consciousness, the most common response from people across the world is, is that dualism is true. Most people are, are dualists for whether or not it's philosophically motivated or religiously motivated, one way or the other. You don't seem to um, buy into the idea of like a classic substance dualism, like Descartes dualism, maybe. Why don't you opt in for the dualist response like like most people? Yeah, you're completely right. So, I mean, you know, when I was taught philosophy as undergraduate, we were taught that these were the only two options. You know, either you, you're a materialist and you think you can account for consciousness in the terms of quantitative physical science, which seems to me wrong for the reasons I've been giving, that consciousness is a is a qualitative phenomenon and hence can't be entirely captured in purely quantitative terms. The other alternative we were taught was dualism, that consciousness is, you know, outside of the physical workings of the body and the brain. But I guess, yeah, I guess I think this is pretty hopeless too. I mean, m- maybe the worries of dualism are more straightforwardly scientific. Mm. You know, so most dualists, although they think the mind is distinct from the brain and the body, in general, they still think there's a there's a pretty close causal interaction, a pretty intimate causal relationship. You know, your you know light hitting the retina of your eyes causes visual experiences in the soul or the immaterial mind, and vice versa. The decisions of the mind move the body. But then, you know, I think if you've got to think about what would things look like if that were true, if there were an immaterial mind impacting on the brain every second of waking life i think that would kind of really show up in our neuroscience you know there'd be all sorts of things happening in the brain that had a, had absolutely no physical explanation it'd be like a poltergeist was playing with the brain and that doesn't seem to be what we find in neuroscience so i think that gives us a, a strong and ever growing sort of inductive case against dualism yeah so it's rather than classically people say it's like causally closed like the physical can't interact with the non-physical you don't seem to have a problem with that as much it's more that we'd expect unpredictability in how the brain's like lighting up if there was an immaterial soul or mind acting upon it and we don't see that um 
in, yeah, when absolutely. We look at brains. It'd be like there was, you know, it's, it's, it's the analogy I give in the book is suppose you had a god who was very, very regularly intervening in the physical world. Obviously, it's controversial whether there are miracles, but, you know, it was very, very regularly healing disease and, uh, you know, that would become obvious because there would be changes in the body that couldn't be physically explained all these miracles happening and it's it's actually exact pretty much exactly the same if there were immaterial minds there would be all these little miracles happening in the brain all the time it would be you know even more obvious than an interventionist god and you know we don't seem to see that i mean i, I guess the, the other more straightforward issue dualism is sinning against Occam's razor, you know, that this theoretical imperative to have the simplest theory consistent with the data, the um, postulate as few entities as possible, rather than having, you know, the dualist has physical stuff and completely non-physical mental stuff, this, this radical division in nature. It's, a, it's an ugly, divided, disunified, profligate mm. picture of reality. You know, I'd rather go for that than deny consciousness if that's what we need to do. But I guess I think there are more elegant, parsimonious options. You, you, you mentioned there, Philip, that you'd rather go in for dualism than deny consciousness. But lo loads of people do deny consciousness. I want Maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but there is another option on the table here um, that is, you know, equally as you kind of um, parsimonious or elegant and simple and this is you know the view that you mentioned in the book which is um well galen strawson calls it the silliest claim ever made but the view put forward by i think people like daniel dennett or keith frankish which is illusionism um now the illusionist thinks that consciousness is like magic right although people can do tricks and cut assistance in half and we might think we need to invoke some special power or properties to explain magic we actually don't we're just misdirected we just can explain magic in the same way we can explain non-magic now you say in this in the book that in accepting illusionism one thereby undermines the evidence for being an illusionist it's a bit like believing that someone never tells you the truth because they tell you so. What do you mean that this option, Philip, that of accepting the truth of illusionism is self-undermining? Because there are lots of people out there, as Galen Strawson has highlighted for us, that believe in illusionism. Yeah, well, I mean, I've got more time for illusionism than most of my anti-materialist comrades Um you know, some people just oh, get really annoyed and don't even, you know, I'm happy to try out all kinds of views and give some credence to, to, to all possibilities. And, you know, I'm good friends with Keith Frankish and it's fun chatting about these things. Um, but yeah, I, as you say, I do ultimately think the view is, uh, in a certain sense, self-defeating because I mean, our, our access so, so I guess the thought is that the, they're going to want to say there's some scientific grounds, empirical grounds for thinking consciousness doesn't exist. I'm never quite clear what those grounds are. That's one problem. But but even suppose there were, our access to empirical reality is via consciousness. You know, I know of, I only know that there's this table in front of me because I'm having a conscious visual experience. So our access to observable reality is mediated via consciousness so as i say in the book you know it's like thinking that science could give you reason to doubt the reality of consciousness is a bit like thinking astronomy could give you reason to doubt the reality of telescopes you know you, you need a telescope to do astronomy you need mm. consciousness to to do science you know you you through your consciousness you access the results of experiments and so on so so in that sense it is sort of self-defeating but what if would you say to so you say that science doesn't give us reason to doubt the existence of consciousness, but what if Dan Dennett's not going to go, oh yeah, consciousness doesn't exist, right? Because when we spoke to him, I think we even said that to him, we said... He's got the wrong idea about consciousness. Yeah, we said, does consciousness exist? He said, no, of course it exists, You just it's not what you think it is. So someone like Dan Dennett's going to say, oh yeah, science doesn't give us reason to think that consciousness doesn't exist, but science might give us reason to think we're wrong in thinking it is this special stuff, right? And that's what they're going to say. So you mentioned in the book, is it Paul Bloom, the psychologist, who says from a young age, children start categorizing things as 
mental and physical. And you say this isn't evidence for thinking that consciousness doesn't exist. But someone like Dan Dennett might go, yeah, but that's evidence for thinking that we're wrong about thinking it's this special property, this phenomenal consciousness, soul-like stuff, right? Yeah, so I guess maybe that sounds like a slightly different position to illusionism. And Daniel Dennett seems to go back and forth by... So, the, the, I mean, there's a radical illusionist view that consciousness just does not exist, mm-hmm. which Keith Frankish kind of... I mean, it's always slightly qualified, but does kind of sign up to. But then there's the other view that we it's consciousness exists, but it's not what we think. Um, I mean, I might be open to that. It depends what exactly we get wrong. I've never said that we're completely right about all our ordinary intuitions about consciousness. I suppose my starting point would be that consciousness is an essentially quality involving phenomenon you know you when you're having a red experience you can attend to the reddish character of the experience when you're feeling pain you can attend to how the pain feels that's a reality that's immediately present to you so i mean that would be my starting point and i guess if dennett thinks that's an illusion a i'd want to hear the argument and i guess i mean look i'm not saying i know anything for certain even the reality of consciousness. But the reality of my own feeling of pain and the qualitative character that that involves seems to me better known than that this table is in front of me. So look, you've got to start philosophy somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, the reality of my own quality involving experience seems a, a, as good a starting point as any. Um, I mean, one one more thing to add, actually, and this is you know, you sort of simplify things a bit for, for for the book, but go. Well, no, actually, I do talk about this a little bit in the book. You know, it, 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 one thing depends on what you think is the relationship between thought and consciousness, mm. to whether actually illusionism is a coherent position. Uh, it is actually still the dominant view in Anglo-American philosophy that thought has nothing to do with consciousness. Um, you know, you know, you and you look at the mainstream views in the from the 20th century about thought they don't mention consciousness at all the views of fodor and dennett and um donald davidson so if that's right that thought has nothing to do with consciousness Mm. then illusionism is at least coherent you could think you're conscious without actually being conscious however i am one of the growing minority of anglo-american philosophers who think actually thought just is a kind of consciousness, and Galen Strawson is on board with this too. Now, if that's right, which is admittedly controversial, although I think, you know, undergraduate students tend to think it's, in my experience, tend to think it's just obvious that thought is a kind of consciousness. I noticed on one of your recent podcasts I listened to, actually, people were all saying, this is just so obviously true. Why do they... But anyway, maybe maybe in 10 or 20 years, everyone will think it's obvious that what is now this minority view that thought is a kind of consciousness. But anyway, coming back to illusionism, if thought is a kind of consciousness, it does follow that illusionism is incoherent because you can't think you're conscious if you're not, if thought just, if thinking just is a kind of consciousness. So ultimately, I suppose I do think illusionism is incoherent for that reason, but that relies on a controversial view that thought and mental representation are inherently wrapped up with consciousness to simplify then galileo or what you describe as his error is taking consciousness out of our picture of the world and we we need to go back and try and see how it can fit in and the dualist um i guess stays true to the to the idea that consciousness does exist and is real and i know what it is what consciousness is but it adds too much to the picture the uh, the denier, as we've called them, doesn't do justice to the nature of consciousness. Um, so what is this new foundations for the science of consciousness? What do you want to change? Being dualism and the physicalism we've discussed here are, are essentially inadequate. What would you like to change? What is this this new revolution of science that perhaps you're proposing in the book? Yeah, that's very nice of putting it. So I think the science of Galileo, the science, the scientific paradigm we still operate in today was not designed to deal with consciousness and is inherently incapable of, although it's a very important part of uh, science of consciousness, it's it's inherently incapable of giving a complete account of consciousness. 
So I think we need to move to a more expansive conception of what science is. Uh, this doesn't mean stopping doing physical science or doing physical science any differently. It just means it's not the full story. We need a conception of science that takes seriously both, you know, the quantitative properties of matter that we've did, been dealing very well with for the past 400 years and the qualitative reality of consciousness as we're aware of it in our immediate experience of our immediate awareness of our own feelings and experiences. We need to find a way of bringing these together in a single unified worldview. Um, so what is this this unification? You, you mentioned in the this revolution, just to quote you here, uh, the roots of this revolution were the rediscovery by Strawson and others of crucial work on consciousness in the 1920s by philosopher Bertrand Russell and the scientist Arthur Eddington. Um, what is the... Oh, I know you go on and say, I'm convinced that Russell and Eddington did for the science of consciousness what Darwin did for the science of life. What is it that they did and what are you taking from them to, to merge what you say is to re-emerge consciousness into our picture? Yeah, so it's very much take, taking root in this very important work, as you say, of Russell and Eddington that's got tragically forgotten about for so long and has recently been rediscovered and causing great excitement in academic philosophy. This part, part of the reason I wrote this book was to try and get out these ideas that are causing so much excitement in academic philosophy to a broader audience. Mm. So the, the starting point of Russell and Eddington is that physical science doesn't really tell us what matter is. And that seems like kind of a bizarre claim at first. You know, you, you read a physics textbook, you seem to be learning all these incredible things about the nature of space and time and matter. But what Russell and Eddington realized is that physical science, for all its richness, is confined to telling us about the behavior of matter, about what it does. So, you know, physics tells us that matter has mass and charge. Um, these are all completely char characterized in terms of behavior. You know, charge is a matter of attraction and repulsion. Um, mass concerns gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. This is all about behavior. So physical science leaves us completely in the dark on what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of matter, how matter is in and of itself, independently of its behavior. So it turns out there's actually this huge hole in the center of our scientific worldview. And then the proposal of Russell and Eddington is to put consciousness in that hole, right? Or more, let me let me say that more precisely, the proposal of Eddington building on Russell is to put consciousness in that hole. So we're looking for a place for consciousness in our scientific worldview. We've got a hole in our scientific worldview. Let's try and put consciousness in the hole. So the result, the resulting view is a kind of panpsychism. This is the ancient view that Consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the physical world. But this is panpsychism stripped of any mystical or spiritual connotations. So there's there's just matter, particles and fields, the kind of things physics talks about. But matter can be described from two perspectives. Physical science describes it, as it were, from the outside mm -hmm. in terms of its behavior, what it does. But matter from the inside, that is to say, matter in terms of its intrinsic nature is constituted of forms of consciousness. So it's a beautifully simple, elegant way of integrating consciousness into our scientific picture of the world. So I, as I sometimes say in, in the 1620s, Galileo separates out the qualitative and the quantitative. In the 1920s, Russell and Eddington find a way of bringing them back together. So we've spoken about the combination problem on the show before, and you, you give this nice, interesting example about Lego bricks in, in the book. And, you know, I have a big um, pile of Lego bricks and I put them together to build something. It's clear like I build a tower or something else. But this, this idea of Russellian monism or panpsychism, we've got these hundred minds and if we put them together in some kind of structure, it's not clear that this unified experience, this one whole mind comes about. And you talk about uh, two different solutions or two different approaches, one being Laplace's demon and the other being uh, like emergentism or something like that. Um, now, Laplace's demons, is it micro-reductionism? Is this the right term? Mm. And we've got, if I had knowledge of every single thing in the world, then I might see how consciousness comes about. 
So mm. someone from this view might just say, the combination problem, i.e. how do lots of minds form one big mind, isn't solved yet because we don't have the complete understanding of every single little part of the universe. And mm. you don't think this works and you'd prefer us to go for some kind of immersion. We had Heather Hassel Merck on the show talking about uh, integrated information theory. Is this, this the kind of uh, view you'd prefer over micro-reductionism? Does that make sense? Yeah. There were, since I wrote the book, I think maybe a simpler way to put it is just strong or weak emergence. So, so the question is, you know, what's the relationship between particle level consciousness and systems level consciousness? Mm. You know, the consciousness of the parts and the consciousness of the whole. And we can, it, the, the choices really are either strong or weak emergence. emergence. So this, let's put it this way. The strong emergentist thinks to get from the particle, the particle to the system, to bridge the gap from particle consciousness to systems level consciousness, you need basic fundamental principles of nature. Right. You know, so it could just be a basic law of nature that when you have conscious particles arranged in a certain way, you thereby have a consciousness attached to the whole. So that's the strong emergentist view. The weak emergentist view basically says you can bridge the gap without recourse to new fundamental principles of nature. You know, merely having the particle level consciousness perhaps arranged in a certain manner automatically gives you consciousness of the whole. You know, so so I think, you know, I don't know, I think both of these proposals have, you know, there's there's people working on on both of these options and have very interesting ideas. As you say, Hedda Hassel Merck has a very interesting proposal on, on the strong emergentist version, interpreting the integrated information theory of consciousness in terms of um, a strong emergentist panpsychist view. And, you know, it's a wonderful example of science and philosophy coming together mm. to, um, you know, shape a theory of consciousness. I mean, I'd, I've got a lot of problems with, with that specific view, but I think it's it's kind of the closest we've got to a complete theory of consciousness. But there are also interesting proposals on, on the weak emergentist front. I talk about Luke Roloff's thinking about split brain patients, mm -hmm. patients who have the corpus callosum in the center of their head divided. And this leads to a kind of peculiar fragmentation of consciousness, which is sort of the reverse of mental combination. We've got one conscious subject it seems that when you when you sever the the corpus callosum that joins ordinarily the two hemispheres of the brain, you get one conscious mind kind of fragmenting into two. So if we can kind of understand what's going on there and sort of reverse engineer it, then that might give us clues about how to understand, you know, mental combination. Or um, there's a very good philosopher called Gregory Miller who does some really important, interesting novel work on um, how, how to make sense of mental combination and mental emergence. So I just think, you know, it's no one, no one yet has a complete science of consciousness. It's very much early days. I think most of the scientific community isn't really thinking about the problem in the right way to start off with. Uh, but it just seems to me the problems facing the panpsychist look to be more, look to me more tractable than the problems facing the dualist or the materialist. So, Yeah. You mentioned the problems facing panpsychism there. Um, but we've got a listener question here from Darren Rondganger from South Africa. And he says, lots of people talk about the combination problem being a big problem for panpsychism. But what are some of the lesser known problems for the view that you think are, are interesting and are challenging for the panpsychist to have to answer? Yeah, that's a good question. Um I suppose there's there's a worry about how we can ever get any kind of positive understanding of, the, say, the experience of particles or something. You know, Nagel famously said, how can we ever know what it's like to be a bat, given that a bat has, has such a different form of life than us, echolocating around the world? How can we know what it's like to adopt the perspective of a creature that echolocates its way around? So much more alien must be, the, you know, the consciousness of, of fundamental particles. And, you know, it, it, it might end up that we can't fill in all the details. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons people like to cling to materialism is the way of doing science we get from Galileo is really nice, objective, 
quantitative you can you know it's objective and publicly observable you can be precise about it i think a science of consciousness is in- inherently going to be less precise more speculative because the phenomenon we are dealing with is is subjective is qualitative you know it's not publicly observable and it, you know it could be that that we're not going to be able to fill in all the details we either pretend it doesn't exist, as, as most people seem to do, or you take it seriously, you find a way of doing science and you do the best you can. And, you know, it's early days. Who knows? You know, we might be able to we might be able to fill in all the gaps. And I don't think we know yet where the limitations are. And, you know, some really exciting ways of thinking developing here. The Mystery Philosopher. So, uh, Philip, at the end of our part one sections now, we play a a small game called Mystery Philosopher. So you're going to hear a quote from uh, a philosopher, and you've got to try and guess who the philosopher is. I've got a sneaking suspicion Greg will know exactly who this philosopher is. So feast your ears on this and see if you know who the philosopher behind the voice is. A football match is like the story of two men and a bear. Neither man can outrun the bear, but they each need only outrun the other. Do you know who that philosopher is? <laughs> uh, well, he's talking about football. I wonder whether it's my colleague Stephen Mumford. It's your <laughs> colleague Stephen Mumford. <laughs> well, just because I know you interviewed him yesterday, so it's kind of <laughs> cheating, really. But uh, Join us uh, next week where we'll be speaking to Philip Goff uh, more about um, philosophy of mind, but also the ethical implications of panpsychism, something we've long been requested to talk about on the show. It's already available on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash panpsychast. There's also access to our uh, pre-episode, um, the pre-show that me and Greg refor- recorded beforehand, where we're talking about identity and Paul Rudd. So ha- there's lots of reasons to head over uh, to patreon.com forward slash panpsychast. A link's also in the iTunes description. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>